breaking the spirit of struggling. Let me begin by asking a question. Have you worked so hard for so many years with little progress? You've done everything it takes, worked so hard, but everything you have is on debt. You literally have nothing to show that is totally yours. You're barely making ads meet. Life has become a struggle despite many years of hard work whether you're in business, private practice, or you're employed, you seem like there are many wasted years going round and round in vicious cycles. Let me surprise you. There are people who have not struggled through this life. I didn't say they have not gone through challenges. No. They have gone through challenges like anyone else, but whatever they touched with their hands prospered. I'm sure you know people, by the age of 25, they were millionaires and they were doing what they loved doing. They started an initiative or an innovation and immediately it prospered. But perhaps you have tried one business after another, one career after another, but things are not working. We need to address it right now. Everything Isaac touched with his hands prospered. Even during the famine. In Genesis 26, 12, Isaac planted crops during a famine. He planted crops in the land and the same year reaped a hundredfold, meaning a hundred times over. A hundred percent return on investment. Why? Because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich. And his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. Imagine being so blessed of God that your neighbors begin to envy you. And these are blessings that took place when there was famine in the land. In today's language, God blessing you when there is recession. When there is even inflation, it seems like you're protected from the economic environment of the day. Right in the desert for 40 years, God provided to the children of Israel a whole nation, 2.6 million people, without planting a crop for a single day, without keeping livestock, 40 good years in the Sahara Desert. Because our God is not limited to the environments. He is above nature. He is the God of nature. In Exodus 16, 12, at twilight, you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, you are God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when they cooked it, it is tasted like wafers. Verse 35. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. They had bread in the morning, meat in the evening. When I was a little boy, I used to hunt birds. And I tell you, it's difficult to catch even one bird. Imagine quails covered their doorsteps in their thousands. You know, you can struggle to hunt one single quail for weeks, but when the weed of the Holy Spirit comes, he can drive thousands of them right into your shop, drive customers right into your business, bring favor right at your doorsteps. And that's exactly what happened in the wilderness, in the vast desert for 40 years, because God is our source. Today I want to share with us three points on this momentous subject of breaking the spirit of struggling. Point number one, work is a blessing. Struggling is a curse. God intended us to work, but God never intended us to struggle. Right at the genesis of man, 
God created work long before the fall of man, long before the curse. God created work. Why? Work is a blessing from God. Lack of work is from the enemy. God intended each one of us to work. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Genesis 2.15. As a matter of fact, God gave man work before he gave him a wife. He gave him work before he gave him children or a family. The first assignment God gave man was work, not even a family. Because work is a blessing. But after Adam disobeyed God, the same ground that used to produce good fruit worked against him. Because God cast the ground on behalf of man. This is the genesis of struggling and hustling. Genesis 3.17 To Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cast is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. All the days of your life. Struggling was a cause. Before the fall, there was, a, there was fruitfulness in the land. After the fall, weed, thistles, briars, pests were competing with this crop. Work became a struggle. Work became a curse. This curse was broken on the cross. Jesus became poor only at one point on the cross. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was a man of abundance. Jesus kept on giving. He fed the hungry. Jesus was a giver. Only at one point was Jesus poor. And that's on the cross that we may become rich. That's where this curse was reversed. If you have gone through the cross, this curse is reversed. If you have not faced the cross, the ground is still cursed. Work is a struggle. If you are a child of God and struggling with your work, you are struggling illegally out of ignorance. And that's why we have to break that ignorance today. They shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What you do not know can kill you. The enemy thrives in ignorance. That's why he's called the prince of darkness. If you do not know what you're entitled, you are likely to struggle because you don't even know your portion, your inheritance. Now, prosperity is a blessing. Moses told the community in Israel, if you obey the Lord your God, the Lord will set a blessing on your burns and on everything you put your head to. Deuteronomy 28, 8. God will bless everything you put your head to. Every project, every business. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he's given you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. Abundant prosperity. In the fruit of your womb, that's your children. The young of your livestock and the crops of your ground, that's your business. In the land he sought your ancestors to give you. Verse 12, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty. Unlimited, infinite resources to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. How many would like that? For God to bless the work of our hands. How many? This is a blessing. You will lead to many and borrow from none. Today, God's children are full of debts. And we have accepted it as biding. Yet the scripture says, we shall lead to many and borrow from none. For many years, banks in Europe were owned by Jews. And that's why Adolf Hitler was so jealous of them. And he began to annihilate them out of jealous. You know, if you want people to hate you, begin to prosper. When you become blessed of God, you attract haters. That's exactly what happened in Israel. Because these guys were money leaders. Literally, they're the ones who started the banking system as we know it. 
It is my prayer someone listening to me right now under the sound of my voice will be launching a business, a bank that will be led into many and you will never borrow from any. Prosperity is a blessing. Guess what? Struggling is a curse. Deuteronomy 28, 15. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses, all these curses, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You'll be cast in the city and cast in the country. Whether you try to work in the city or in the countryside, it's still a curse. Verse 17, your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. And the crops of your land and the calves of your hands and the lumps of your flocks, the Lord your God will send on you curses, confusion and rebuke in everything you put your head to do. When you see struggle, scripture makes it clear this is a curse. Read verse 15 again. All these curses will come upon you. God never intended you to struggle. He intended you to work, but not to struggle. What's the difference? When God has blessed your work, whatever you touch with your hand, whatever business you open, whatever career you touch, it prospers. It thrives because it's God, the God of increase, multiplying you. Point number two. How does the spirit of struggling enter one's life? I know this is a concern for many of us. So let me share with you five ways the spirit of struggling enters one's life. Number one, being out of the will of God. You will never prosper outside God's will. Birds never struggle to fly. Fish never struggle to swim. Why? They are operating in their domain. You will never have dominion outside your domain. Your first assignment is to discover your God-given purpose. Your second assignment on this planet is to pursue your God-given purpose with singleness of heart and never to deviate it to secondary activities. It is knowing the will of God concerning you in every season of your life. The Lord Jesus Christ called the 12 disciples on the shores of Lake Galilee from fishing fish to being fishers of men. But after the cross, they lost hope and went back to fishing fish. In John 21, 3, I am going out to fish. Simon Peter, the ringleader, told the rest. And they said, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. That night, they caught nothing. Why? They were out of the will of God. They never thought that God is able to provide to them if they, were a, if they stick on their purpose. And that describes some of you. There is someone listening to me here today. They're in a job they hate, but they don't trust. If they pursue their God-given purpose, God is able to provide alongside that purpose. So you picked whatever job was available just to pay the bills. You hate Monday mornings because you do something you hate just to make ends meet. If you continually do what you hate, you will hate yourself. I dare you today as a child of God, the first step towards avoiding to struggle is stepping into the will of God. Being in your natural element. Being in your space. Doing exactly what you know is what God wanted you to do. No matter the challenges, you enjoy the flow. It's like effortless and seamless. I guarantee you right now, I can preach to you today the whole day. I'll be stopping because of your time. But I can speak this message until 6 in the evening because I'm in my natural space. I'm in my natural element. This is the real me. This is my DNA. And the first step towards fulfillment in life is being exactly in the will of God. Because God makes provisions when you are in his will. God closes every tap outside his will. They run dry. 
The second reason why people struggle is the spirit of begging. I am not necessarily talking about begging in the streets. We have professional beggars at homes. An adult child who refuses to work. Siblings who look up to their brother or their sister and they refuse to work. I'm not talking about women who are taking care of their children and cooking for their families. No, that's work. I'm saying people who are literally doing nothing, making no contribution, looking up to their parents or their boyfriend or their girlfriend to provide. So long as you look up to a man or to a woman to provide for you and you're not mentally ill, you are a dark curse. Jeremiah 17, 5. This is what the Lord says. Cast is the man, cast is the woman who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Verse 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Hear me, young ones, in this service. Immediately you hit 18, begin to earn. Stop depending on your parents. So long as you're not overwhelmed by your academics, start earning. Many people struggle in this country because of trusting the government social scheme. They wait on the government to be their provider. Cast is the man who waits upon man. God is our source. And he wants anyone who is able, who is healthy, to get out there and be productive. Don't be dependent on others. Don't be a parasite. Step number three, the reason number three why people struggle in their lives is the names we were called as children. Someone called you a loser, a failure. You are amount to nothing. You will never make it in life. There was such a man called Jabez. That name Jabez means pain. His whole life was full of pain until he came to his realization why he struggles in life. First Chronicles 4. 9 to 10. Jabez was a better boy than his brothers. That's my version. The NIV version is better than mine. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him so. I mean Jabez saying, I gave birth to him in pain. And his life became painful. Jabez, verse 10, cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Why? He was limited by his name. Now he's praying, God, enlarge my territory. Enlarge my borders. Increase me. Expand me. Promote me. Let your head be with me and keep me from harm so that I'll be free from pain. And God granted his request. May this service be your Jabez moment. For God to increase your territory. For God to expand you. And to hear your cry. You've got to reject some of the words you are called when you are growing up. Be careful with the words and the names you call your children. Number four. Rebelling against God. A lot of Christians are actually victims of rebelling against God. Not in this church. Most of you in this church are very faithful givers. It's amazing of all the promises of God in the Bible because every single promise comes with a condition. Every promise. Even the forgiveness of sins comes with a condition. Repentance. Financial blessing comes with a simple condition. Giving. Listen at Malachi 3, verse 9. You are at the Akas, your whole nation, because you're robbing me, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Not 9%, but the whole tithe. 10% of all your income. Some people ask me, Pastor, do I tithe my net or my gross? People ask that question because they want to give as little as possible. I would rather be saying I have given 11 or 12 or 13%, but I don't want to discuss, to have those discussions with God. The simple answer is this. You tithe after tax, all the income, everything that hits your hands or your bank account. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. This is the only place God tells us to test him. 
says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Trust me, when it comes to financial blessings, no matter how much we pray together, you have to obey God in giving. The more you release, the more you receive. That's a principle of this life. Everything God created gives. I have heard Christians over the years saying that tithing is for the old covenant. It is not for new covenant believers. That's not true. Let me just tell you something. There are things in the scriptures that were before the law and after the law. Let me begin with the Ten Commandments. All the Ten Commandments were before the law and after the law. Let me explain. Do not murder. That command was there before the law, during the law, and after the law. Today, God is still saying, do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Do not worship idols. This has nothing to do with the law. Even the Sabbath was long before the law. It was instituted by God in Genesis chapter 2 when God rested. Three things changed after Jesus died on the cross. Number one, Jesus became our Sabbath. He is our rest. The second thing that changed is how we worship. We don't sacrifice bulls and animals. Why? Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the third thing that changed is how we enter into covenant with God. And that, in the old covenant, it was circumcision. But watch this. Circumcision was before the law. Circumcision was God speaking to Abraham as the only route for people to be recognized as his children. Even people who are not Jews, they had to enter into covenant with God through circumcision long before the law. In the new covenant, it is the circumcision of our hearts. Why? We are sealed by the precious blood of Jesus, not the blood of circumcision. That is the only thing that changed. Nothing else. Tithe was long before the law. My friends, now let me just show you from scriptures. Jacob tithed, Abraham tithed 500 years before the law. Why? Because he gave his tithe to Jesus. What stopped at the cross was the Levitical order. Jesus was not a Levite. Jesus hailed from the tribe of Judah. The Levitical order stopped. The order in which Jesus came, the order of Melchizedek, he remains a priest forever. He received tithe before the law and after the law. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1. Melchizedek was king of Salem, that's Jerusalem, the city of peace, and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. This is Melchizedek blessing Abraham. Who is Melchizedek? Look at verse 2 and 3. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Abraham, the man of God of the hour, then gave 10% to Jesus. And the other does not want to confuse you that this is Jesus. He says, first, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. That's Jesus. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, there is no other man. No man, no woman had no father or mother. Every man, every woman had a father and mother, except Adam and Eve. Listen to this, verse 3. Without father or mother, the writer wants you to know this is Jesus. Without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. He remains a priest forever. Verse 4. Just think how great Jesus was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Verse 17. For it is declared, you, Jesus, are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, not 
under the Levitical order of receiving bulls and slaughtering them for the forgiveness of our sins. But Jesus, in the order of Melchizedek, remains a priest forever. So he receives tithe before the law and after the law. I know some of us here may be struggling with this concept. What I suggest to you, please, there is a video I did called You Shall Prosper, a message I preach in this church. Take time. Listen to that message prayer-free. Don't force things. Even if it takes you two months, one year, two years to process, begin a journey. Pray over it. Seek God concerning this matter for him to reveal to you the truth about this matter. When you hear something one or two or three times spoken by the pastor, rather than taking your old stance, please pray for it. Even take a day, pray and fast over it. Lest you stand on your own way. Lest you block your own blessings. Trust me, if you seek God concerning this matter, he will reveal to you. He will speak to you. And you can do that by listening to the message I have recommended to you. You shall prosper in my YouTube channel. I have addressed this subject in minute details. The fifth way through which people struggle, why people struggle, is generational curses. Exodus 20, verse 5 and 6. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That's what we call generational curses. Verse 6. By showing love to a thousand generations, of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's what we call generational blessings. So watch this. If you have come to Jesus Christ, let me make it very clear. No generational curse has power over you. Jesus became a curse on that old rugged cross that you may be blessed of God. Galatians 3.13 Every curse spoken over your life, every struggle along your lineage was broken at the cross. If you are not born again, all the struggles of your ancestors will haunt you all the days of your life. This is what we call generational curses. Only the cross of Jesus has power to break generational curses. How then do we break the spirit of struggling? Five steps to break the spirit of struggling. Number one, identify the enemy. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. In the, in the King James Version, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. God never intended you to live sufficiently, barely making its meat. God intended you to live abundantly, in abundance, in affluence. If you struggle with this reality that God wants you to be wealthy and rich, please, you will never conquer the spirit of struggling. The first step to out of overcoming the spirit of struggling is identifying struggling as an enemy. This is a spirit from hell. This is not a spirit from God. Identify struggling as an enemy that you need to fight. You have to accept this is not the will of God. Jesus made it clear. His will is for you to live a rich and satisfying life. Look at it again, John 10, 10. It is God's will for you to live a satisfying life. If your life is not satisfying, this is not the will of God. Identify that as an enemy. Don't Accept your situation as biding. Step number two to break 
the spirit of struggling. Fight the enemy. Don't negotiate with the enemy. Don't allow him to whisper to your situation. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. The devil never releases his prisoners. He never frees his prisoners. You can't bargain with him. You can't negotiate with him. You've got to resist the devil. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 18, whatever you bind on earth will be bowed in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding the strong man. Put on the whole armor of God. Paul writes to Ephesians. Buckle your belt of truth and the blessed plate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. Shod your feet with the readiness to preach the good news and hold the big shield of faith to quench, to stop the fiery darts and arrows of the devil. And with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, slash the enemy, praying always in the spirit. That's the whole armor of God. You've got to fight the enemy. Step number three. Get into the will of God. Make sure at any given season in your life, you are where God expects you to be. Imagine Isaac in the day of famine in enemy territory among us the Philistines. God tells him, don't go down to Egypt. The Egyptians for over 4,000 years were very good in irrigation. Egypt depends on the river Nile. Let me tell you, if you touch the river Nile, it's a military issue. I once went to Aswan High Dam. We were with Mercy. They protect it with soldiers 24 hours. Right now, there is a serious international dispute between Egypt and Ethiopia regarding the waters of the Nile. But they were the earliest known community to harness the power of irrigation. So when the entire Middle East suffered famine, there was always food in Egypt. That's why Jacob went there with his children. That's why Abraham went there when there was famine in Canaan. But God told Isaac, don't follow what Abraham did. I will provide to you right where you are. Let's read together Genesis 26, 1 to 3. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, for I will be with you and will bless you. Early alone we read the same chapter, verse 12. God prospered him a hundred percent. Get to know where God expects you to be in any season of your life. God is well able to bless you right where you are. Amen. Step number four. Proclaim victory before it happens. Remember the formula of the world. I will say it when I see it. The formula of God, say it, you will see it. Say it, and you will see it. So the children of Israel had to proclaim victory over the walls of Jericho for seven days. If they reasoned, we shall only shout with joy when the walls come down. The walls will never have collapsed. It's against the principle of God. God's ways are not our ways, Isaiah 56. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As the heaven is far away from the earth, so are his ways above our ways. And his thoughts above our thoughts. God says, this is my formula. I speak things that are not as though they are. And I dare you right now, speak victory before you see it. Speak about your marriage before someone proposes to you. Speak about your blessing, your business, and put a billboard about the hotel you're about to start 
or the hospital or the school, even before you see it. Get the architectural designs and hang the billboards. That's the language of God. James 3, 4, and 5. Take sheep as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boats. What's that? Your tongue is the rudder that steers your life. Your life follows the direction of your tongue. You will never go where your words have never gone. Your life, your health, your business, your prosperity, your children follow your tongue. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. The words you keep speaking to your children will become their reality. The words you keep speaking to your health will become re your reality. Keep complaining every day how you're distressed and depressed and you'll be killed by depression. Keep speaking, I'm prosperous, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I am rich. And your life follows those words. Your tongue is the rudder of your life. Proclaim victory before you see it. Scare the enemy. Guess what? The enemy is not omniscient. He doesn't understand your thought processes. He can't read your mind. When you keep saying, I'm sick, he makes it permanent. When you keep saying I'm rich, he believes you. He takes you serious. There are no jokes in the spiritual realms. You are a spiritual being living in a physical reality. Every word you speak has the power to create or to demolish, the power to build or to destroy, the power to bless or to curse. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Don't take your words lightly. If you want to change the direction of your life from this moment, change the direction of your tongue. It is the rudder that steers your life in the turbulent high seas. Command those high seas to come for your sail. Step number five on the last one. Step out by faith. Faith without works is dead. James 2.26. What am I saying? If God has put in your heart to start a chain of hotels, it is starts with a seed, a single hotel. By that lad, call me. I will come with the anointing oil and prophesy over your land. Don't try to figure out where the money will come from. Your job is to step out by faith and start that hotel. Let me ask you a question. I would rather you wake me at three in the morning and say, Pastor, I'm distressed. I don't know how I'm going to pay this month. 30 millions is due for payment. I will be very, very stressed if you wake me at night because you're stressed by a project of $1,000. If you're going to be stressed, you'd rather be stressed by a serious project anyway. Why keep abusing your mind with small projects? Do you realize right now, with or without a major project, you're still stressed? You'd rather be stressed by a major project rather than keep being stressed by small things that even if God answers that prayer, it will not make a difference in your life. Next month, you will still be praying for a financial breakthrough. How dare you take a project? If it fails, you cannot give pastor, adult prayer warriors, peace. You are waking up the whole nation because you need an urgent miracle. Why keep trusting God for a miracle that can't make a difference in your life? I dare you right now, start that school. I dare you right now, start that hospital. I dare you right now, start the chains of hotels. Look, 2019, 2020, 2021, Elon Musk could not get any sleep because of Tesla. I understand that, and I salute such a man. 
Because when the business came back, the man is the richest in the world. Men, the children of this world are more wise than the children of the light, Jesus said. They understand these principles. They run by these principles. It works for them because these are God's principles. Yet we in the kingdom are continuing to struggle because we never exercise our faith. Faith is not talking. Faith is getting out of your couch and pursuing that dream. Faith is getting out of your couch and doing it. Faith is action. Faith is deeds. Faith is not talks. Will you receive it? What is God telling you this weekend? Could you just take a moment and ask God, what are you telling me this, this morning? Just take a moment alone with God. Take a moment alone and ask God, what are you telling me? What is this that you want me to do? It's so huge that it needs you for me to do it. It's so huge that only you can do it using me. Because God never calls you to do what you can do on your own. Never. If you can do it on your own, that's not God calling you. God gives you a project that will require your total dependency on him and him alone. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. Dear Jesus, you said in your word, whatever we shall ask in your name, you will do it. John 14, 14 and John 16, 24. And now, Lord, I thank you for every project, every business presented by this beloved. I speak a breakthrough to everyone who will pursue their dream today. I speak a miracle and provisions and capital, infinite provisions to everyone who will take a step of faith. We bless you, Jesus. Look at me. Look at me, each one of you. If you're going to start a project that is bigger than you, God will never, ever provide to you 100%. Never. God will provide you what you need for this week and this month so that you learn how to depend on him. He told the Israelites, if I drive all the enemies before you, you are going to reject the land. You are going to fear the land and go back to slavery in Egypt. So you have to conquer little by little. Because God wants a relationship. It's not about property. He wants you to continue building a relationship with him. And be dependent on him. So if you are going to start any meaningful project, he will make provision as you start. The floodgates of heaven will never open. Until you start the project. Even if you are a faithful tither. One principle does not negate all the other principles. You must step. You know what? Until they stepped into the waters of Jordan. The waters never parted. Are you with me? You've got to take that step. And then God provides. Take that step. And then God provides. When we started this church, we launched it without knowing where we are going. I remember paying the rent for three months when we didn't have anybody. And we kept trusting God. And that's how God provides. We got this building 100% free of charge. We never did any fundraising. This church has zero debts. And I can tell you, yeah, praise God. That's something to thank God for. I'm glad I say it. I say it at the hearing of everyone. We owe nobody alive or dead any coin. Your pastor walks debt free. And this church walks debt free. And I believe each one of us. Once you take the first step. God makes provision for the next. And the next. I will be praying for you guys. I will pray special prayers. For anyone who wants us to break the spirit of struggling. This is what I am going to do. Today I will not pray for you here. I'll pray for you in my office with anointing oil. In this church, I don't accept offerings in my office. 
I don't do that, so don't try to do that with me. If you have any offering or any tithe, give it in the church. Give it here. Freely I have received, freely I give. When you come to my office, you only come for prayers. Are we together? I want to do this because some people may be having very personal issues and they want me to address or even generational curses that are hanging over your life or your family. Come to the office. Today I'll pray for you. You'll be kneeling down. I'll pray for you with anointing oil as a point of contact with heaven. And I want you to go home free and free indeed. If you're watching me online and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment. This is your day. Come, come to Jesus. The first step towards enjoying God's abundance is becoming a child of the Most High God. You have no right to claim God's blessings until God is your Father. If you desire to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're watching me on Facebook Live, pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, please write to me on this Facebook Live. I prayed to be saved. If you, read, if you write that, I'll reach out to you and share with you some materials to help you grow as a Christian. Write simple words. I prayed to be saved. Just to help me to identify you. I promise you, I will reach out to you and share with you new believers' materials. Children of God, are you glad you came to church? Yes. Can I bless you now? Yes. Your hands like this? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord bless you and be gracious to you. May the Lord bless you in the course of this week. May God go before you in this week, blessing the work of your hands. May God rebuke the devourer out of your ways. May you prosper in everything you touch with your hands. May your children be blessed in the city, in colleges, and in the countryside. May you succeed in everything you touch with your hands. In Jesus' name, and God's children say it, amen and amen. Shalom. Were you blessed by this message? Are you blessed by my ministry? I would like to invite you to be my ministry partner by sending me your love offering every month. I've shared with you the giving options on the screen. Help me to spread the gospel around the world. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to hit the bell to get notified whenever I upload new videos. And if you're visiting the Atlanta Metropolis or you live around the Atlanta area, Welcome to Family Church, 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia.